Hello, my name is Naila Kalita May, and this video is entitled Representation in Contemporary Canadian Theatre. I teach at the University of Waterloo, and I am an experienced artist and scholar in the areas of performance studies, gender studies, critical race theory, autobiography, and autoethnography. The representation in contemporary Canadian theatre that we will focus on in this video is that of those communities who have historically been omitted or underrepresented on mainstream theatre stages on this mass of land that we now call Canada. Some of the ways the plethora of communities that make up Canada could be identified is by their ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, ability, class, or gender presentation. There is most certainly an ethical imperative for artistic directors and board members of theatres across the country to produce, on their main stages, high-quality theatre from this wide range of underrepresented communities. They are communities whose rich performance traditions generally differ in content, style, and function from the male-centered, white, middle, and upper-class European theatre aesthetics that have guided much of the decision-making around play production on mainstage theatres in Canada since the mid-1800s. And what is key in the context of this video's discussion is that each of these underrepresented communities represent, as all communities do, various points of human difference. So, let's spend some time talking about difference. Feminist Audre Lorde wrote, quote, We have all been programmed to respond to the human differences between us with fear and loathing, and to handle that difference in one of three ways. Ignore it, and if that's not possible, copy it if we think it is dominant, or destroy it if we think it is subordinate." End quote. So, how do we ignore difference? Have you ever heard or said the following when talking about someone whose skin color was different than yours? I don't see color. Well, that kind of statement is often used in moments when the speaker wants to convey that she, he, they believe that we should approach our interactions with one another based on the fact that we are equal human beings and not based on stereotypes associated with us. But the truth is, unless you're visually impaired, you do see color. So when someone says, I don't see color, they're actually telling the listener that in order to treat them as an equal human being, they have to make them invisible. That's not helpful. Lord argues that another thing we do when we encounter human difference, which we do every single day, is that we, quote, copy it if we think it is dominant, end quote. So fashion trends are an easy example of how we copy difference without understanding its context or significance. Every few years, white European and North American apparel and accessory designers integrate the aesthetics and of other ethnicities into their wares, from West African prints to the wearing of native headdresses. Difference is stripped of context and co-opted by the mainstream. That's not helpful either. Lastly, Lord argues that the other way we exhibit fear and loathing in the face of human difference is that we destroy it if we think it's subordinate. A prime example of this is what some call the school-to-prison pipeline in the United States of America that funnels a disproportionately high number of African American and Hispanic people, especially males, into the lucrative prison industrial complex where they become a politically disenfranchised and underpaid workforce. This isn't helpful either. From casual statements to designer clothing to imprisoning young men, there are far-reaching implications for our collective unwillingness to acknowledge and grapple meaningfully with the complexities of human difference. 
We all have different skin colors, ethnicities, sexual orientations, ages, abilities, social classes, and gender presentations. That is not the problem. The problem is, as Audre Lorde wrote, quote, we have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals, end quote. In other words, we don't know how to know that each one of us is different and know that each one of us is also an equal human being. Our differences aren't the problem. What we do with them is. Three plays that demonstrate the rich complexities that human difference can bring to Canadian stages are Where the Blood Mixes, by Kevin Loring, Angelique, by Lorena Gale, and Yifrud, by Julie Tepperman. Each of these plays engages with human difference in nuanced and meaningful ways that underscore the urgency and importance of dealing with human difference. In Kevin Loring's play, Where the Blood Mixes, we are introduced to the characters Floyd, Mooch, and June, three middle-aged Native peoples who were forced to attend a residential school on a reserve in Lytton in British Columbia. As children in the residential school, Floyd, Mooch, and June witnessed and experienced various forms of abuse that haunt not only their lives, but also the lives of those on and off their reserve. The audience is also introduced to the character of Christine, Floyd's daughter, who was removed from his care after her mother died. Loring's play is a slow and steady meditation on history, legacy, and connection. Its complexity lies in the multiple points of view that it offers, including that of the river that inspired the play's name. It is a play that asks challenging questions about individual and collective responsibility for what the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Committee on the Indian Residential School System recently called, quote, cultural genocide, end quote. In Lorena Gale's play, Angelique, the audience is thrust into the life of the protagonist and historical figure, Marie-Joseph Angelique, a black woman who was born into slavery in Portugal in 1710, sold into slavery in New France, now called Quebec, in 1725, accused of burning down the city of Old Montreal in 1734, and then tortured, hanged, and burned. Gale's play disrupts what scholar Catherine McKittrick calls, quote, the safe haven myth, end quote. And that myth is that Canada's only relationship to the transatlantic slave trade is through Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. Gale's play, however, reminds its audience of the truth, which is that slavery existed in Canada a full century before Tubman and the Underground Railroad. Gale's play is set in a world where, as she writes, then is now, now is then, end quote, which asks the audience to connect histories of slavery in Canada with the present day in complex ways. In Julie Tepperman's play Yeshud, the audience attends the Orthodox Jewish wedding of Rachel and Chaim, two observant Orthodox Jews navigating the borders of tradition. And, of course, the audience isn't invited to their actual wedding because they're characters in a play, but in the performance that I saw at Theatre Pass Marai in Toronto in 2011, the production's design invited the audience to feel as though we were at their wedding. The bride and groom greeted us in the hallway. In fact, all of the public spaces of the theater building, exterior included, were redesigned to conjure the aesthetics of a synagogue. The impact of this immersive theater experience was that it enhanced opportunities for me as an audience member who is not an Orthodox Jew, 
to have fleeting moments when I considered our human differences from a slightly closer vantage point than that of a strict outsider. Theater can do that. Theater can plunk us face to face with our human differences and permit us to have visceral and cognitive experiences that influence our points of view, not only as audience members, but also as actors, directors, playwrights, and producers. To be clear, theater is not only about what the audience experiences, it is also about what we experience as theater practitioners and the ways in which our perceptions and capacities to encounter human differences can be productively influenced by making theater that represents a wide range of communities. Scholar Trinti Minha wrote, quote, You who understand the dehumanization of forced removal, relocation, re-education, redefinition, the humiliation of having to falsify your own reality, your voice, you know, and often cannot say it. You try and keep on trying to unsay it, for if you don't, they will not fail to fill in the blanks on your behalf, and you will be said. End quote. Kevin Loring, Lorena Gale, and Julie Tepperman are playwrights who have, through the plays I've touched on here, done what Minha described. They've said it, articulated complex, undertold stories. They've said it, stories of human difference, as all stories are. Stories that could have otherwise been collapsed into stories of difference that Audre Lorde cautions we often end up fearing and loathing because we don't know what else to do with them. Loring, Gale, and Tepperman are most certainly not alone. There are a host of playwrights and plays across this expanse of land that we call Canada that tell disparate, contradictory stories of human difference. Our human difference must be represented on our main stage theater stages from coast to coast to coast in Canada by the people, content, and aesthetics of the plays we produce, to the cast, crews, and directors who create them, to the administrators, board members, and institutions who fund them, to the audiences and media who attend them. Our task, then, is to write, produce, and act in more of these plays so that we increase our opportunities to ethically represent ourselves on main stages as we work to understand our differences while simultaneously understanding ourselves as equal.